Znači, dobro večer na otvaranjeto na revijalnega programa na ovo godinešno do 13. izdanje na Filozofski i Filmski festival i na projekcijata na Tuki Buki, senegalski film od 1973. godina, na Džibril Diop Mambeti, režisir koji nekako po navika ga narekuva jedan od najgolimite v istorijata na afrikanski od film i mnogo često kako in najeksperimentalnijot. Do nekaj ironično, ko se zdaj ima predve, da ga v eno intervju, što ga ima nekaj prikrajati na svojo život, veli, da ga nikogaš ne se gledal sebe si kako režiser vopšto, od pričina, što sem vsakal povremeno, da snimi nekaj film in vistina v tekot na celi od svoj život, za žal ne mnogo dolg, počinjava na 53 godine v 95. godina, ima snimano samo četiri filma in dva kratke filma na početakot. Evo, znači, vsega ne dojadja gosti na Neil Kennedy, znači, koji što ki ima na kraju od izlaganja, toga što, koliko ne znajete angliski, ki bi bilo mnogo težko da sledite, zaradi to, što ki nemamo prevod. Ama se nadalom nekaj, ki može da sledite. Ki kažem vsega in nekoliko zvorve na kraju na angliski, ako ne, da zaokružime za mnogo dojedenite gosti. Znači, kako ste rekel, ima snimano samo šest filma, prvi to dva kratke, in ste četiri dolgometražni filmovi, ako teško je, da se nareče dolgometražni neko odne v veliki se četirjesetina minuti. In vse, ko je tja četiri, je del od nezavršena trilogija, prvi to dva se od nezavršena trilogija za alčnosta, naredni to dva od nezavršena trilogija za obične delogije, a kako što je rekel, za žal njegovi od prekratok život mu imal nevozmoženo, da ga završi filmovite. Ovoj film v 1973. godina je dobitnik na dve goljami nagrade, na Međunarodno to žiri na Cannes in na specijalna to nagrada na žirito na Moskovski od filmski festival. Ko ima snimeno imam peti, kako što veli v eno drugo intervju v MIG na nasilna kriza v njegovi od život, poradi što sakal, da eksplodira. Kako što veli, Martin Scorsese bo povedat na kriterijon izdanijato in na listina to se slučiva, ki vidite vibrantni boji, mnogo energija in mnogo eksperimentalni tehniki, koji što nalikuva na evropski te od francuski od Nov Brand, makar što imam čisto, da ga ta bi bilo navrata za mojom biti, vidi, ki to je vopšto, ne se ga da zboriva z Evro, pa smeta, da je Afrika treba da razvije sobstven jazik, sobstven stil in da ga na nekaj način Evro pa samo preči, bo to je, da se so zdali so samo novo kino, a to je afrikansko to kino. Ki vidite, tukaj mnogo nasetuvanja na to, a ovaj film je debitanski od film na mom beti, naredni 20 godini nema da snimi ni to jedan film, a naredni da tri filma, ki ga snimi v poslednji ta pet godini od njegovi od živa. So, welcome ladies and gentlemen, for the ones that don't understand Macedonian, somebody is already laughing because they are going to hear this for the second time, uh, but I'll be briefer in English uh, because uh, our guest certainly doesn't need to hear about Tukibuki. He will be the one talking about Tukibuki after the screening. Uh, uh, as I already said in Macedonia, this is uh, uh, the debut film of uh, Gibril Diop Mambeti, uh, uh, Senegalese director, often considered one of the greatest uh, directors in the history of African cinema and one of the most innovative, daring. Uh, it is um, uh, an awarded movie. It has won uh, the International Jury Prize at the Cannes uh, Festival in 1973 and the Special Jury Prize in uh, Moscow. Uh, it is an experimental movie. You'll notice uh, many interesting techniques like um, I don't know, colliding montage, jump cuts, etc. Uh, reminiscent of those uh, practiced by European directors uh, from the French New Wave. Uh, you'll also notice some interesting fantasy sequences and, and many, many references to tribal, tribal rituals in Africa. Uh, as I said, this is one of only four movies, four feature movies that, that uh, Mambeti made in his life. Uh, all of them part of trilogies the first two part of an unfinished trilogy on greed and, and power and madness and the other two part of an unfinished trilogy about the ordinary man. Uh, and I guess without further ado, I will invite you all to uh, enjoy 
and experience this movie. Uh, and hopefully most of you will be able to stay after the movie. It lasts only 19 minutes. Uh, we will have um, uh, a lecture by Neil Kennedy. Uh, he comes from Ireland, Trinity College. And afterward, we will have a Q&A session. Uh, but I'll introduce him better in 90 minutes. Until then, do enjoy and have a lovely evening. We'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you for staying so far. Uh, for the ones who would like to stay for 20 more minutes, at least. Uh, <laughs> more. More. <laughs> uh, we have a wonderful lecture by Mr. Neil Kennedy. As I already said, he's a teaching fellow at Trinity College Dublin. He has been a guest lecturer at the Royal College of Art in London. Uh, fortunately, starting very soon, uh, I think that he should be uh, visiting uh, prof professor at Ankara. Yes, yes. Uh, he, uh, he was part of our two so far conferences, uh, Film and Philosophy, uh, as part of the inaugural conference two years ago. Uh, he had a lecture uh, on the uh, fantastic in the works of Nasser Hamid, and now, uh, just a few days ago, I think a week ago, uh, he had a lecture on The Quiet Girl. Uh, and uh, now he will have 20 minutes to present his introduction to, to Kibuki, even though it comes after the movie, so in a way it will be a coda to the movie. And afterward, we will have a Q&A session. Anyone who likes to, to ask him a question, uh, please stay around. The floor is already yours, so take it away. And thank you so much, Victor, and thank you everybody for staying. I hope you enjoyed the film. Very interesting film, a very, uh, in, in some respects, a difficult film to really categorize. Um, what we've just seen is one of the great classics of African cinema, by one of its most creative and challenging directors, uh, Jibril Job Mandetti. But many film fans, many film scholars, find it difficult to categorise and to fully understand and to analyse. Oh, you can all hear me? Yeah? Good? Okay. Um, it's a post-independence film, but it doesn't speak at any great length about the African independence struggle, or about imperialism, or about colonialism, or about neocolonialism, or economics, or any of these things. It's not a political film, rather it's a kind of young person's escape fantasy. The dream of leaving your home in Dakar or in Senegal to go to Paris. And it seems to have no easy resolution. So in the talk I'm going to give you today, just for a relatively short time, I want to tell you a little bit about the filmmaker, uh, Jibril Jok Mandeti, as well as the film that we've just seen, and uh, maybe a bit more about, about the rest of his work. So, um, Mambeti occupies an unusual place in global cinema and in film scholarship. He's a self-taught filmmaker from a suburb of Dakar in Senegal, and his uh, creative and highly experimental films examine the lives of marginalised people in the modern African city. His own unusual position within cinema history is at one at the same time both marginal, but also recognised and critically acclaimed. And he had a very short uh, career, uh, dying young, dying in his 50s, uh, in the 1990s, uh, due to alcoholism. So he was fated at Cannes, where he won the International Critics Award for this feature film, Tukibuki, or Journey of the Hyena. And he was nominated for the Palme d'Or for his second uh, feature, which was Hyenas, or Ien. Uh, he was described by Nwachuku Franku Kadike, a uh, leading scholar of African cinema, as one of Africa's greatest auteurs and a rare artist of exceptional insight and perception. Yet he was marginal in many other ways. He struggled to attract funding for his films, either from African or international sources, and indeed he was frozen out by the post-independent Senegalese film establishment. He was a self-taught filmmaker 
who never attended film school in Paris or Moscow, unlike many of his contemporaries, like Usman Sembeni from Senegal or Sheikh Omar Sissoko from Mali. Um, and indeed, he had a limited formal education. He has attracted much less critical and scholarly attention than filmmakers of a similar stature from outside of Africa. And in common with other African directors, his films have had difficulty finding distribution, whether in Africa or elsewhere outside the festival circuit. And we're lucky that this one has been restored so that we can see it. Um, throughout most of the 50 years since his film was released, it has been very difficult to see, and it's only become more possible more recently in the age of the internet. And more importantly, he's the author of only a small body of work, uh, two feature films, four fictional shorts, and one short documentary. So the question that I'm thinking about, now that I'm thinking about writing a book about him, is how should we define him thematically, stylistically, ideologically, as a cinematic author? Well, um, I believe that his body of work can be divided into two main creative periods. The first from about 1968 to 73, when he shot uh, Tuki Buki and his first two shorter films, including Babu Boy. And then the second, after 19 years away from filmmaking, with the second feature, E.N. or Hyenas, from 1992, followed by two shorts in a planned trilogy, which was meant to be called the Conte de Petit Jean, or Tales of Little People, uh, before his tragically early death in the 90s. Um, as we judge the emergence of Manbeti as an author, are there any clear and pronounced distinctions between his early and his late work? And do these changes in themes and content and style and form bear any relationship to each other? Well, in this festival we are shining a spotlight on Jean-Luc Godard and his contemporaries in the French New Wave, and indeed film historians like Annie Winchang have persuasively argued that Manbeti was profoundly influenced as a stylist by Godard and the New Wave movement. In fact, he's called the Godard of Africa. So the theoretical principles and formal and stylistic elements which characterise that movement characterise Manbeti's films too. So these include techniques like the use of direct handheld cameras, and you saw they were often mounted in, on motorbikes or on vehicles in that film. There's also discontinuous editing, there's breaks in chronology, so the film, the film jumps forward and back in time, in time, and there's dialectical montage, in other words, montage showing two contrasting scenes, one after the other, in order to elicit a kind of point. There's a minimal dialogue, there's an extra diegetical soundtrack, or a soundtrack with sounds which don't exist in the world of the film, uh, and the inclusion of what seems to be dream sequences or fantasies. So in Tuki Buki, a fairly simple narrative sees the central pair, our hero Mori, the cow herder, who rides a motorbike with a cow skull, a zebu skull, that's the cow with the long horns, uh, on it, and his girlfriend, Anta, the university student, who attempt to leave, they dream of leaving Dakar for the promised land of France. But as they progress towards their goal, sequences are repeated, key elements of narrative are omitted, such as Maurice's escape from the university students who kidnap him, and other sequences and images and characters are included, which are difficult to explain except if you, re if you resort to a kind of dream sequence. So the most important one, in my view, is uh, the clip that we saw when the film is just reaching its denouement, when the two lovers, just before reaching the port, after having stolen the, um, the, the car and the clothes from Charlie, you see them in a kind of, if you like, dream sequence, uh, uh, parade in an open-topped car right in front of the, of the presidential palace, waving to the crowds with a ceremonial escort, and everybody is praising them and seeing how great Mori is. Actually, this footage was taken from actual footage of a real presidential parade in Senegal. And this fantastic sequence, entirely out of keeping with the previous development of the, of the narrative, or explicable in any rational way, can maybe be best interpreted as this desperate dream of two desperate and impoverished individuals imagining themselves to be wealthy, powerful, and magnanimous. But this isn't the dream of two individuals who are confident and capable of change or of becoming masters of their own situation, as we might expect in maybe a more standard 
politically engaged film. It is ultimately an escapist dream, which demonstrates, at least for one of the pair, the Mori, the young man, the hollowness and vanity of the entire project of Escape to France in the first place. And indeed, we shouldn't be surprised that in the end, Mori fails, fails entirely to board the ship. Um, looking at montage, you can see Menbeke's use of montage provides repetitions and digressions and cutaways to images which both complement and contrast the other images in a sequence. So we saw at the beginning of this film disturbing scenes of animal cruelty featuring cows being butchered in a slaughterhouse, which contrasting with shots of Mori on his motorbike and a younger boy, which could be the younger Mori, herding cattle. And indeed that suggests that cows, cow imagery, the cow skull and so forth is kind of a, a recurring theme representing what is safe, what is known, what is, uh, you know, at the, at the home of the two individuals, which represents their lives in Senegal, if you like. Um, the recurrence of these images at the moment that Mori refuses to board the ship to France hinted his own fears of an uncertain future, his preference for the familiar. And indeed, I think these recurring motifs, such as the skull on the motorbike, help to keep the film together, despite the occasional confusions of the narrative. Um, let's also look at the complex role of sound. Okay? In this film, the audio track often has a separate in, uh, existence to the visual imagery, and at times it's not an audio track at all, but instead an audio commentary. Um, the sound sometimes provides an ironic contrast, such as when we hear of Josephine Baker's constant refrain, Paris, Paris, to represent the dream for Paris, as Mori and Anta survey a field full of cattle in a landscape full of scrub. And I think sound is interesting in Mambeti's work because what we know of his early experiences watching or experiencing cinema is that he would be forced to stand outside an open air cinema because he didn't have the money to get in and listen to film, and all he could get was the sounds of the film, whatever Western or whatever Indian film was being, was being played. And so sound, I think, in his film is very important. Um, these films, I think, the demands these techniques place on the audience are much greater than the most common tradition in African cinema at the time, which was a socially realist film. So films from directors like Guzman Senben were often made with explicitly ideological motives or as part of a project of nation building. So I think of Senben's films like Manga Di or Shala, both of which criticise the political elites and the commercialised society in post-independent Senegal. And these films tended to have linear plots, to use standard camera angles and to look for continuity in editing. Um, while St. Ben's films are always propelled by narrative or ideological purpose, Mambetti's have ironic and humorous dead ends. Um, critics have related the extreme formal experiment experimentalism of the French New Wave to an almost bourgeois hyper-individuality, a focus on the atomized creative individual. So films like this depict alienation and solitude they speak of um, an attitude common to post-war youth in Europe and also in post-colonial Africa. Ideologically speaking, they also point to the lack of a clear and defined project of critique, which marks Mambeti's earlier work. So just, should we just simply condemn him as a filmmaker, uh, too caught up in his own cleverness, ultimately as a curiosity whose main accomplishment was to import new wave of bourgeois experimentalism to Africa? Well, let's not be too hasty. Um, in his later work, and I'd encourage you to take a look at it, such as the short film La Petite Vendouze du Soleil, or The Little Girl Who Sold the Soleil, and his second feature, EM, uh, show films which are much more conventional than the film we've just seen. They offer a more ordered, coherent narrative framework, without dream sequences, without much of an extra diegetical soundtrack, even excluding musical sequences and songs, and without discontinuous uh, editing, uh, though they do uh, have a reliance on, uh, on anarchy. But looking at these two films, we can see that Tuki Buki and also the short Badu Boy shows us the heroes of Mandeti's early work, 
They are young men living in the fringes of society who survive poverty by guile and cunning and by their willingness to cheat and steal. They are the representatives of the hyena, which for Mambete is a symbolic figure of great importance, the trickster god or the trickster spirit of the West African oral tradition, which of course uh, stretches back for centuries. Uh, in both ba Badu Boy, the protagonist in that short, and Mori, the anti-hero of this film, uh, they both mock and outsmart authority. In the form of Charlie, for example, the wealthy man who Mori tricks and robs in order to gain the necessary funds for the passage to France. These are films which exalt in a fairly immediate way the marginalised and the disadvantaged. And Mambetti's politics in these early films uh, show a contempt for the powerful and a fellow feeling for the underdog. Yet his work doesn't uh, point to any kind of systematic diagnosis of the ills of Senegalese society. So in this film, for example, there's a few gestures in a political di direction, but in the main, these tend to take the form of a generalised distrust of authority, wealth and power, while at the same time the protagonists fruitlessly long for the same wealth and power themselves. The structure of this relatively simple plot is circular. The protagonists, at least Mori, finishes the film more or less where he started. He does not leave for France, the, the most his sensible goal throughout the film, while his girlfriend Anta does. Um, so here I would say that Mabeti's politics are inchoate, he lacks a project of critique of his society or any kind of emancipatory dimension. But as we move into his later works, politics take a more central role and political and economic systems of oppression are analysed more systematically. As Van Beatty later stated in an interview, my task was to identify the en enemy of humankind, money, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. But Van Beatty is more pessimistic than his contemporaries. Nowhere in his work do we see any salvation offered either in the form of a Marxist transformation of society, or through the root of anti-imperial struggle, or indeed through African nationalism. Van Beatty is well aware that African elites are as capable of pillaging the people, the ordinary people, as a form of colonial powers were, and the simple fact of African independence does not solve deep-rooted African problems. And I think we can see that in this film from the hero's constant interactions with the police and how the police exist simply as a means of keeping the poor people down. And they are just as corrupt as the, uh, as the uh, colonial police which preceded them. So ultimately, in my view, um, ultimately, in my view, the development of Mambeti's work eventually points in the direction of from less experimentation and form, but a deeper and more systematic conception of politics, while all the while falling short of the liberational optimism of someone like Sarah Maudoror in San Bizanga or Guido Ponticorvo in La Bataille d'Angier. And it's a huge regret, in my view, that his early death has left us only with this small but unique and intriguing body of work. And I hope we can discuss this more. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, if anybody has questions, uh, feel free. Probably you can hear me. You can hear me? Okay. Uh, so, first, thank you, Neil. And uh, if anybody has questions, please don't hesitate to ask. You can also ask in Macedonian if you like, and we'll translate. If not, I, I have questions. Uh, no. uh, um, uh, first of all, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Neil, for, for uh, I, I didn't know Mambeti and I didn't know this movie before you, you pointed it out, and um, I enjoyed it even more this time around because I watched it just recently for the first time, and the images and everything is quite striking, and, and, and the entire movie uh, speaks of some things that the later movies of Mambeti, as you said, speak explicitly, implicitly. So that is my first question. Don't you think that, in a way, through the very form of this movie, because Mambeti was dreaming of uh, rejuvenating, or rather creating African cinema, 
he was being, and this reminds me of my question about <laughs> uh, the quiet girl that I had for you, uh, political, but in a, in a purely aesthetic way, because he was trying to challenge, uh, you mentioned some then and, and African cinema, which was made in a certain way, uh, by, by doing away with European influences, uh, even though they say that it was influenced by, by mm -hmm. New Wave and, and you mentioned, but he was trying to find something more unique for the African country. Yeah, I think that um, it, there, there's, it's not entirely clear if there was a project there. I think that a lot of this is at an impressionist level. Um, I'm not sure I agree that he was trying to do away with European influence. Um, I do think that uh, his movies are not first and foremost in the service of some kind of ideological project. I think his movements are first and for his movies are first and foremost for art. They're first and foremost aesthetic. So um, in that respect, maybe he's a more uh, real or true filmmaker than someone like Sam Ben is, because Sam Ben very clearly switched from writing novels to films simply because he could get a bigger audience for his style of politics. Okay? Um, having said that, is there, is there politics in this film? Absolutely. Um, but I think that the film celebrates a kind of... The film celebrates an un the underdog. Um, and I think the film celebrates the kind of roguish figure of the the trickster young man, or the you know the anti-hero, um, the guy who's willing to use theft or violence or lying to get one over the powerful people, be they the police or rich people or foreigners. But I don't think it necessarily goes much beyond that. Or, but maybe you, you've thought of something. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's a very very interesting point because I was thinking along those lines when I said. Uh, uh, doing away with, with European influence, I wasn't, uh, uh, I wasn't implying that he okay. wanted to do that uh, consciously, but uh, he was in a way, because I know that in the later stages of his life he was trying to uh, promote African cinema by, by introducing pocket movies, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, like filming them on VHR, mm -hmm. his second movie, Hyenas, and making them available for everybody because he believed in a way that uh, African cinema had, has to have some kind of an identity uh, and, and it can only gain that identity from within, mm -hmm. not, not from without. Because, because uh, uh, the problem was, after all, and the problem is here, that you, you, you mentioned precisely that uh, about um, him celebrating ordinary people and, and the other movies are precisely about that. But even here, it feels like uh, they are dreaming, they are marginalized uh, at the bottom, and they are dreaming of being marginalized on the top. Hmm. Yeah. But the problem is, in a way, even though the movie feels like Anta is the one who is saved mm -hmm. because she lives on the ship, mm -hmm. uh, in many ways it feels like Mori is the only one who has some kind of a future, and uh, in the second movie, uh, he he uh, he wanted to follow Anta and, mm -hmm. and see what would happen uh, when when she comes back to to the car. Yeah, there's a lot in that. I mean, I think first of all, the big problem with cinema it are two things. First of all, the cost of producing a film, and certainly that was much more in the 20th century. Secondly, just distribution. Okay, just how to get your film into, into cinemas, and for a long time that was the only way it could be seen. Um, you're right that he did look into trying to promote video production and VF, VHS, this was in the 1980s, 1990s, um, as, as a way of trying to democratise filmmaking, but really his death came before anything major could be accomplished in that respect, and to be honest it's only today with the internet that we can see, you know, maybe this vision is now more possible, the fact that you can have a sort of democratised space of exchanging films, producing films for relatively cheap, you can make a good film now on your mobile phone and, you know, uh, sharing it via the internet with people. Um, so what I would also say about the, um, 
your second point. Uh, absolutely. I think it's interesting. You have this division between Mori and Anta. Anta sets off for France. Um, and I, I think there is, it's quite interesting to look at the gender divide there, like the kind of the, the, the roguish kind of young man gets stuck back in Senegal and the young woman gets to go to France. But in the second film, as you say, Hyenas, it's a story of an old woman that comes back from, from abroad with more money than the World Bank, according to the, the and a quote from that film, and sets about destroying and hyper-commercialising her society, her hometown, and trying, trying to, 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 to gain vengeance on her former enemies. And Mambete explicitly links Lingaya Ramatu, the woman in that film, with Anta. So the idea is that even those Africans who are lucky enough to get to go abroad, you know, become corrupted by the world that they find and come back and wreak even more damage on their on their home. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, uh, isn't it that they are, they feel like they are lucky, uh, but in a way, isn't Mambeti saying that they are the unlucky ones because he was never, he said uh, in an interview that uh, right before the end of his life, and he quoted from the same interview, he said that um, uh, he, uh, whenever he felt the need to leave, Mm -hmm. He would always resist the temptation because that was for him the only way to remain authentic and pure because there are the problems in France and everywhere there. Mm -hmm. They are the ones that have corrupted the society which he is trying to build. Mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why, in a way, but it is interesting now, uh, Hyenas is, is uh, in, inspired uh, by, by a Swiss writer, right. by Friedrich Direnberg. Yes, so it's inspired by a Swiss play. So there's no such thing as an African art, which is totally separate from, from Europe. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's true that um, he wasn't educated in a film school abroad, in, like in Paris or Moscow, like most of African directors were. Um, and he didn't, I, he, he didn't build a life abroad like Nasser Kamir has done, for example. Um, and so he has, more than most African directors, He's tried to keep grounded in, although he did travel in Europe, but he's tried to keep grounded in, in Africa, I think, in interesting ways. And he very much demonstrates the, um, I think this film too demonstrates the, the fruitlessness and the vanity of dreaming that the solution is going to be elsewhere, right? That, that if you can just get on the ship and just escape, get past the policeman and just get to another country and somehow work it all out, that your life is going to be perfect because ultimately I think this film demonstrates that, that it probably isn't. Yeah, yeah, that, that reminded me of a quote by, by Vincent Kemby in a short review of the movie wherein he says that even though it feels like they're dreaming of running away, mm -hmm. uh, it is more like they're dreaming of having been there mm. and now returning to their country mm -hmm. and being treated like celebrities. And all those, uh, that, that was what I found, found, found most striking in the movie, that, that it was even made, like this was made 50 years ago. Like, so so it, is, it is the right moment to, to show it 50, 50 years ago and it was made uh, in Senegal. Like it, uh, but don't you think maybe that precisely because it was made 50 years in Senegal, this movie was possible, or as you said, it is uh, too, too radically different from anything made during those years in, in, in Senegal and Africa in general? Um, I suppose it, it's different from a lot of the films and a lot of the filmmakers that were going on in the 1970s, 60s and 70s because most of those films probably believed that there was some kind of solution to be found, you know, either in, either in revolution or in just kicking all the white people out or somehow rebuilding African society, even Pan-Africanism. And I think probably film, a films made today would be uh, more pessimistic. So maybe more in keeping with ultimately with this, um, with this film. Um, what was the first thing you said? There was something I was going to say about it. Uh, yeah. About the fantastic sequences showing them not mm. as if they had 
Yeah, so absolutely, yeah. No, that's very striking too. What they're dreaming of is being able to come back as big yes. shots, right? They're not dreaming, really. They, they repeat, oh, the Champs Elysees and Lac de Triomphe. These are just words, right? But their, their main dream is, the, is to become the person who can boss everybody else around because they are the rich person and they've got the fancy clothes. And they, really, they're dreaming of the respect that they don't have now. Yeah, so, so like, like I said at the beginning, they, they are now marginalized on the bottom and they, in a way, mm. dream of being marginalized on the top. But mm. even then, Mambete, as you said, is interested in this kind of people, like marginalized. Uh, I, I feel like that we can have this discussion for, for many, many more minutes, but does anybody have a question, maybe uh, related to anything that Said now, or, or even your own response to the film? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes uh, can you talk about a little about having a weird character in the movie, I guess? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, just say again, sir. Just... It, it would be interesting to say something about it. Um, yeah, it's a good point, I think. I think at this point uh, in the film, I think the, or at this point in my baby's career, what you could call either politics of gender or politics of sexuality aren't fully developed. I think in this case, um, Charlie is seen just as an easy mark, okay, as someone who, someone who can be ripped off, who can have his possessions stolen, and perhaps his, his queerness simply makes him more vulnerable, because it means that he has, a, he has an interest in Mori, which Mori could exploit. Um, to some extent, I think that just shows maybe that Maury is, is, is ruthless, is, not, is willing to start, trample over whatever gets in his way. Um, a, a lot of, you see, even now, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that even today, um, it's illegal in, homosexuality is illegal in Senegal, so it all has to be hinted at, okay? And it was probably what you saw was going up to the limit of what was possible to depict uh, on cinema, uh, on, the, on the screen in Senegal. Um, but I think it's, 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 uh, it's interesting to see the association between, on the one hand, this queer character, and on the other hand, um, first of all, wealth, and second of all, if you like, foreign influences. So we see he has an American car, he loves the opera, um, people in his house dressed in foreign fashions, and I think that association is also quite interesting. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very curious to know your opinion about uh, two characters. First of all, the, um, this strange character that is living uh, on a tree mm -hmm. and then takes the motorbike and ends up injury with this accident. And secondly, these uh, professors at the end, these French uh, teachers or professors with this sense of superiority, talking this bullshit about Mao Zedong and all that, I, I would love to, to uh, uh, listen to your opinion on, on both. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. I think the, at the end, I think this is the easier one, the white people are there to be satirized, okay? First of all, because they are I suppose to some extent they have communist convictions and they talk about Mao Zedong, they talk about the Italian Communist Party, but they are revealed to be racists, okay? They have no interest in African art, they say are we just going to spend our money on masks? Um, they, have, they have no interest in leaving the car, <coughs> they have no real appreciation of the society they've been living in, apart from the fact that they've been extracting as they acknowledge, you know, much higher salaries than a Senegalese teacher. So I think, um, if anything, this is just to show that even those white people in the 1970s that one might consider more kind of progressive or more kind of anti-imperialist, actually, in many cases, were not in, in how they believed and how they acted. Uh, the man in the trees now, I find him actually quite a, a, a difficult one to interpret. I really do. Um, it, it's almost as if it, it's almost as if he's kind of a tribes person or somebody from the country, who I think the idea is that he does steal um, Mori's Mori's motorbike and is in the end injured in this this car accident. 
um, whether he just represents, you know, rural Senegal. Um, I mean, he almost looks white, to be honest, in the, in the right. film. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I find that quite quite hard to really unpack. But he, whether he um, represents some form of rural, some form of like rural kind of spirit, or some form of just you know representation of somebody living in a village, who um, who takes the, the who represents what Mori returns to when he decides to leave, to not go on the ship and to, to come back and try and find his bike uh, is possible. But that one is a little bit, I'm a, a bit unsure to ask. Do you have any ideas, Victor? Oh, well, well, I was just thinking it was a great question because uh, the very first thing when he appears, uh, the sounds of him screeching and the uh, seagulls uh, mm -hmm. screeching, they're juxtaposed. Mm -hmm. And that probably represents some kind of uh, connection with the wild, the other side, and I know Mambeti was talking about the hyenas constantly and, yeah. as you said, trickster characters, and about what Mori is unable to escape from, mm -hmm. because uh, hyenas, as he says, are creatures of the night, creatures from the beyond, and they always lurk in the dark, and just like in some Jungian way, the shadow, mm -hmm. they will creep up to you, no matter how much you try to escape, they will come back and take you back. They will never kill you because they don't kill, but they will prey on your corpse even though you're alive. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe he was some kind of a, uh, some kind of an embodiment mm -hmm. of that, as you said, like mm -hmm. uh, spirit of the place that he is unable to leave, but like, like you said, it's a circular structure, but in the end he comes back to the same place where he was at the beginning, but the things are slightly different. Ante is not there, and his mighty beast, the motorcycle, is also not there. It just, just. But these are like, like traces, like memories, and maybe, maybe this is a uh, wild, strange man. He, he is the, the strange man. <laughs> like the weird man uh, represents that, that, that side of of Mori that. He will never, like Faulkner said, the, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. And for, for Marie, that, that happened in the end. And certainly, there's a real association between cows, I think I said before, yeah. and saying there's a point where you have the lowing of the cows, then you have the blowing of the ship's horn, and maybe that's the two possible passages leave on the ship or stay with the cows and stay with cow herding. And that's why you have all these scenes of the cows falling over at the end as he runs to find the, the, the motorbike, um, the, the, the cow slaughtering and everything, and the scow ultimately too. Yeah, he, he's in the between. The, the very motorcycle is partly a cow because he was mm. probably, as you said, a cow herder in the past, but now he's in the between between Senegal and living mm -hmm. here, and his motorcycle is, is uh, like a middle form between cows yeah. and the technology that he's dreaming of there in France, but in the end it ends uh, dead like the cows in the beginning, so mm -hmm. the circular structure, but the, his cow, the, the mechanical cow that's mm -hmm. end, probably is the points to that slight um, um, discrepancy between what was at the beginning and what's now because now even that longing that he had is is lost and that that's what gave him the, the very possibility of moving forward and now how I don't know what what awaits Marie the, the policeman doesn't bother him at the end he just walks past him it's like he's got nothing else to do with him anymore he knows he's beaten <laughs> Okay, well, one more question from me, if, if you have another, I will come back to you. One more question, Neil, uh, slightly personal note now, well, you were talking about the ship and, and, and leaving. I, I, I was reminded that just a year or two before, before uh, Tukibuki, there is a similar scene in Amar Court where once again the ship represents longing and uh, and everybody awaits dreams of living. And very recently, in an Irish movie, Sing Street, here in Sing Street, I don't know it. Which one? Uh, Sing Street, uh -huh. a musical. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
I haven't seen it. <laughs> well, well, it's a yeah, it's a very very recent musical. I don't know which year it was, but once again, it's it's about children in the eighties uh, mm -hmm. dreaming of of uh, 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 forming a band, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's mostly about uh, them dreaming to leave Ireland for for and once again there is a ship and the dream of leaving. So. This is the personal note because we're here in Macedonia 50 years after after this movie and everybody's leaving from Macedonia. We're talking about the situation in Ireland and I, I wanted to ask you that. Are many countries nowadays pretty much what Senegal was in 1973? Is anything really changed? Because many people are just leaving, dreaming of longingly about those overseas Atlantis. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think um, Ireland is a good one to, to bring up because we have gone from a, a country where everybody left, and that was true all through the 20th century. And now we're a pe finally we're a country where people emigrate to. Um, and, and you might think, therefore, the country has made it, but really it hasn't. We have a, a devastating social crisis in Ireland with, with renting and housing and social services. Um, it is a place where people can make money in the short term. It is not necessarily a place where it's easy to have a comfortable life. Um, so in terms of what, well, I, I think, I suppose today we just have this, maybe, we have more migration today than ever. I think that's probably true. And we, we know all the terrible stories of people trying to cross the the Mediterranean uh, on rafts and, and, the, and the channel and so forth. Um, but maybe at least in cinema we have a, a slightly more, real, well we have maybe, maybe that's more widespread the idea that well, you know what, the, the, the pot of gold isn't actually just at the end of the rainbow. And actually I do want to mention um, Mandeti's niece, uh, Mati Diop, is also a filmmaker and she made a film called Atlantique which specifically is about this film, about this um, uh, this modern day kind of movement of people uh, on rafts over the Mediterranean. So I think it would be an interesting one to watch, if you like, in comparison with, with uh, this one. You're referring to the short Atlantiques? No, the, the feature film Atlantique by Matty Diop. Because she, she made a short film just before that called okay. also Atlantique. Uh, and that really communicates with this. I was I was wondering whether it's a direct influence, but now yes, she says uh, that's his niece. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it's uh, absolutely worth uh, so it's absolutely worth looking at those two in, in relation to this. Also, I believe she made a documentary on the uh, the actor who played Mori in tracing his life, uh, and he never left Senegal either. Yeah, those two are tremendous. She's an incredible director. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a, a slightly. Um, a Odd question or slightly at odds with this. Um, I, I, I saw in the in the note here in terms of your biography that you also explore the uh, uh, precariat. That you do some work in that sense. Um, here's an offbeat, um, uh, ahistorical question: How do you think perhaps these people or this society or this author could would react to to the notion of? of precariat of this possibility <laughs> of crisis, <laughs> right? Of this position of perhaps teetering on, on the edge of, uh, of, of a crisis. How do you think that would seem from there? I, I think Mambetti could make a great film about higher education in Europe, you know? Uh, just to show both the, the pomposity of some of these people that think themselves to be Marxists who end up in, in university management. Uh, and also just a lot of it is um, a lot of it, a lot of my experience as a someone who is employed in short-term contracts is a lot of the work that you do is in the hope of getting a permanent job sometime in the future, right? Um, and it is endlessly deferred. The reward is endlessly pushed into the future. Um, so in my case, I, I was homeless actually last year for six weeks because I my teaching contract didn't overlap very well with my rental contract. And Dublin is just a horribly expensive city now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I didn't. I suppose I just put that in as as a note to kind of point out my political activity, and I campaign in Ireland to try and sort this out with these um, 
higher education contracts that we have to deal with. And whether or not Mambeki could, <coughs> I think maybe thinking about his um, second film, Hyenas, which is about um, hyper commercialization and how that destroys societies, you know, I think he could probably do something with the, the, the hyper commercialization that's destroying our education system at the minute. Um, it's something that would be very interesting and very worthwhile, and perhaps we need a hyena or a trickster figure in academia to try to, to kind of point out all the hypocrisies that exist within it. And, you know, maybe that's me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, where does your interest for Fernando Pessoa come from? Well, gee, um, my, um, sorry, yes. Because you, you have, seem to have diversified interests. I do, actually, yeah. My, really, my PhD was on Gilles Deleuze, the French philosopher, um, and uh, his, in particular, his uh, philosophy of art, literature, film, and uh, fine art. And I really looked at the notion of the author in Deleuze, so the author in the broad sense, like a novelist, a philosopher, a film director, and so forth, in relation to this idea of the death of the author, which is very prevalent, but I think is, has been over, over pushed or over, overstated. And I felt that I saw real similarities between some of what Deleuze thinks an author does and Pessoa, if you go back to Pessoa's work, the idea of sort of incarnating a persona or a personality um, and um, the idea of perhaps the author being like the expression of this link between this, if you like, this original character and an author figure. It's a bit to the side of this, but I, I thought that it was a, a useful comparative point to be made in something that, that I could say that was original because although we know that Deleuze definitely read Pessoa, there's not been a lot of work done in, on their relations. So that's really where it came from. And I've read some Pessoa myself, I wanted to do more on it, but then the pandemic happened and it kind of got sidetracked. Uh, but that's, that's, you know, that's the answer, and it's maybe something I hope, I hope to write a book, fingers crossed, if it ever happens, on Deleuze and authorship and Pessoa, and also Pasolini, who was a major influence in Deleuze, I would hope to bring him in as well there as well, too. Yes, there, there is a recently, in Rome actually at the moment there is a huge exhibition of Pasolini because it's happened, anniversary of his mm. birth. In where, sorry? In Rome. In Rome? Yes, yeah. in, uh, in two or three, several museums actually host, uh, mm -hmm. host a huge mm -hmm. exhibition. His body of work is extremely big. Mm -hmm. Both in art, uh, visual arts, and uh, film, as well as uh, writing. Yeah, we um, in Dublin there even three, we three bodies. There are three bodies. Mm. One dedicated to his film uh, mm. uh, works. Uh, another one to his visual. I don't know. Most people don't know. He was a very, actually, a very good painter. Pasolini mm. has got a good body of work and a collector. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was a novelist, and he was and, a theorist, and, 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 yes. and a journalist, I think, also. So he was a, a fantastic man. And yeah, we uh, we had a, uh, in Dublin, in fact, we had a retrospective on his 100th anniversary, so just last year, 2022. Um, and I think he's a major figure for me, and he's a major figure, I think, also for, for Toulouse. So I have to make it to Rome then, how long is it? You should, yeah, I don't know. Probably till the end of the summer. Okay, well, in that case, I'll make a dream. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Somebody was waving at the back. Yeah, he was waving ah. that it's time to time wrap to wrap up. up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so, thank you for being here. Thank you for staying Thank you so much. Up. Thank you very much, Neil, for everything. And, yeah. See you tomorrow. Yes. Tomorrow.